We all know about the Stephen Lawrence murder. The Metropolitan Police were grievously criticised for mishandling the case. There's another murder that's caused enormous concern in the black community and beyond. But now detectives are making immense efforts to make amends. Michael Menson was found in flames, stumbling along the North Circular in Edmonton, North London, exactly two years ago. He died here in hospital two weeks later. The police thought at first that it was probably suicide. But at his inquest, the coroner recorded unlawful killing and the case was passed to the Met's new racial and violent crime unit. Michael's brother and sister are here, along with the Deputy Assistant Commissioner John Grieve. Quasi, um, I know that you were with your brother in hospital two weeks after the incident. He died two weeks later. You managed to get a bit of information from him. What did he tell you? Michael was able to tell us that he had been... Um, on a bus and taken the underground in Edmonton that night and he may have been followed by three or four white youths and that he was attacked by these youths near some phone boxes by Sweet, by, uh, Sweet Briar Walk. Did he explain how he was attacked? What happened? He said that he's, Michael was a very, very quiet and peaceful and family-centred man and he said he didn't approach them, he didn't say anything to them, they had attacked him totally unprovoked. What and else he, did he tell you? He asked me, why did they do this to him? So you say he was a very quiet man. Was he a loner? He was, he was just quiet and he was happy to be him with, with his family and his friends. So he, it was an unprovoked attack? Then? It was totally unprovoked, yes. Mm -hmm. John Grieve, in fact, you've had an enormous amount of help from the public already on this, haven't you? Yes, we've had a lot of information. Um, but we've had a significant uh, series of calls in the last few days in the pre-publicity for this programme. Uh, anything important? I mean, uh, do, you, do you think you've, you've got any handle on who these people are? We think that the people who, the, pe the people who did this, the people they're talking to, are watching this programme. They have been following their publicity. Um, the people we're interested in are the people who are hearing the boasts um, of the people who attacked Michael, but they're also hearing some conscience-stricken uh, people t who were appalled by the events of the, of the night in question. Now, we're not reconstructing anything in this case because so much is already in the public domain, and yeah. your advice is that most people who might phone us already know a fair bit. There'll be people who were on the W6 bus, which is probably the bus that Michael took from Southgate, arrived in Silver Street. There'll be a lot of, there were apparently a lot of people around in Silver Street, even though it's one o'clock in the morning. They might have seen something. Your main target, of course, apart from them, is people who've heard rumours. People who've heard, well, more than rumours. We know people are talking about it. We know people have significantly talked about it in the last couple of days. We know the people that we're interested in are being spoken to by these criminals. We need those people to come forward. In particular, Bits of the jigsaw puzzle are now beginning to come together. Things that were said much earlier in the inquiry now have much more significance for us. If, for instance, there's a couple of anonymous calls early on. We need that person to get back in touch with us. It fits in very significantly with the appeal that we're making tonight. So there were people innocently abroad that night around the phone box, but there were people who were involved in the crime and probably less involved um, and horrified by the turn events took place. No. This could have been a horrendous attempt at humour that went badly wrong. You see, that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if one, two, or even three of these three or four people actually had never intended this should finish up with murder, but are still frightened about calling you tonight because of their involvement in what led up to it. No, no, they should get in touch. The, the, the significant thing is here is that this family is not going to give up. We're not going to give up. Crime Watch has a fantastic track record of success, and I'm certainly not giving up on this one. Can I just mention one thing which hasn't really been published up to now? You're pretty sure the accelerant was a can like this, this is probably something like WD-40. You're very keen, too, to find anybody who was, as a prank, spraying people with something like this, and indeed who sold this yes. two years ago in the North London. And has had it sprayed to them. This, this wouldn't have been an isolated incident. Have you been sprayed uh, with material and then wondered what that was all about, accompanied by horrendous racial abuse, without realising that that was accelerant? Have you been threatened with a lighter? You know, this has got to be part of a serious event. Were you sprayed with this material on the night in question? Much more interestingly for me, if you've got a computerised till rail and you sell this sort of motor oil or other sorts of uh, propellants 
Um, have you still got the tool rolls? Have your accountants still got the tool rolls? We'll be there to see you. Get in touch with us. Not giving up on it. Yes, see, you've heard that the police say now they're not going to give up. Two years on, how encouraged are you that something significant might come out of, of, of the result of the crime watch tonight? Well, this is a very important time for our family. It is two years since Michael was attacked, burned and killed in this way. And we know that we are going to catch the people who did this to him. They're talking about it. So a lot more people know who those people are. Those people will be watching this program. They'll be watching our appeals. They'll be watching the poster campaigns. They're wondering what to do. And they have to phone in. They have to give us all the information they know. There's a suggestion that perhaps one or more of the party weren't so involved. If they really were horrified, if they're making anonymous calls, they've got to follow it through. We are going to catch them, so they have to get in touch with us. They have to give us the information because we're not going to stop yes. until this is brought to closure. Essie Kwesi, thank you both very much for coming in tonight. That musician died after being torched by three men one of whom stole his personal stereo while he was in flames that Old Bailey has heard. Michael Manson 30 was found on fire on the North Circular Road, Edmonton, North London in January 1997. He died on the 13th of February 1997 from complications to heart attacks caused by 30% burns to his back. Three men charged with the murder of Black musician Michael Manson were arrested after realising they were being secretly filmed by police, a court has heard. Harry Chumbalombus Constantinou, 26, detected a video device which had been planted in his flat just a day before. Officers from the Metropolitan Police Racial and Violent Crime Task Force had already been bugging the flat in Edmonton, North London for a month with a hidden tape recorder. Two men have been convicted of killing black musician Michael Manson. Student Mario Pereira, 26, was convicted of murdering Mr. Manson, who was set on fire. Unemployed Barry Chumbalombus Constantinou, 27, was found guilty of manslaughter but cleared of murder. The pair alongside Hassan Abdullah, 50, of Edmonton, North London, was also found guilty of preventing justice by obstructing the police investigation. Four weeks ago, on the 30th of May, 35-year-old Michelle Samarovira was found in a children's playground in Walthamstow in East London. She had been strangled, raped and murdered. Michelle was the third victim of the so-called calendar killer who has struck at least three times in the last three months. In March, he raped a 59-year-old woman on her doorstep. In April, he raped again and in May, he killed Michelle. All three of the attacks took place within just a mile radius of each other, all at around about one o'clock in the morning and all at the end of the month. Well, detectives are so worried that this man will strike again that they're going to knock on 9,000 doors to take DNA samples from Asian men in Walthamstow who fit the attacker's description. It is the biggest operation of this kind in London since the Sally Ann Bowman murder. With me tonight is Michelle's sister, Anne, and Detective Inspector Stuart Hill. Thank you to you both for coming, especially to you, um, And It must be very difficult to be here talking about your sister in such tragic circumstances. What can you tell me about her? What sort of person was she? Michelle was a lovely, caring, gentle person. You know, when she smiled, she lit up, she lit up the room. Her husband um, was diagnosed with cancer, I think it was in about 2002, 2003. She became a widow in November 2007 and I, I, I believe that she, you know, we knew that she would walk out at different times of, of the night and during the day as well, but especially at night. She wanted to go to places that had some significance. She'd even gone back to the hospice a week before she died as well. And what would you like to say uh, to the person, if they're watching, who did this to your sister? Michelle was a young girl. You may have a sister the same age as my sister. You've raped other women, possibly the same age as your mother. I can't believe what you've done to our family. And we just, nothing's ever gonna bring Michelle back. We're never gonna get the real justice that Michelle deserves, but you, we want you to 
to give yourself up basically or for anybody else that has information to come forward because this man has got to be stopped and he's got to be punished for what he's done. And he has got to be stopped. I think it's remarkably brave of you to come and speak to us tonight and we very much appreciate it and we hope that you saying what you've said will, will uh, mean that the case moves forward quickly. Well, the I. Stuart Hill, you're heading up uh, the investigation, a vital investigation. This, you think the name of the calendar killer about him striking at the end of every month is, in fact, a bit misleading. Tell us why. Yes, that is correct. I mean, this is an incredibly dangerous person. Uh, and we are confident that this person, if he stri could strike at any time whatsoever. From his DNA profile, we've linked him to three offences, and we're currently investigating further offences which he may be responsible for. OK, you're doing a massive uh, swab of the area in terms yes. of DNA because yes. you've got vital DNA yes. uh, evidence. Tell us about the area, all within yes. one mile. Well, all the offences have occurred within uh, three quarters of a mile. We've identified 9,000 houses within uh, that area and we will be attending each of those houses to ask for a voluntary DNA sample. And the reason we will be doing that is to uh, eliminate people who, are, who have the same descriptions as our offender. Um, you think he's local? We've got an EFIT. Tell us what's important from yes, the EFIT. We do think he's local. Uh, we think he has good local knowledge. Uh, he either lives in the area of Walthamstow or he has lived in the area of Walthamstow before. Uh, he's Asian, uh, male between uh, 30 and 40 years of age and uh, his height is between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10. He does speak good English but he does speak with an accent. Now, Michelle and the other two victims were attacked around about 1, 2 a.m. Do you think the timings are important here? I think the timings are important, but we must keep an open mind. It is possible that our offender is nocturnal. He may be working through the night, or conversely, he may live close to the area and may have the ability to be able to leave the family home uh, without being uh, out raising any suspicion at all from his family and friends. Uh, we've got some CCTV of uh, Michelle in uh, Summerfield supermarket. Yes, that is correct, yes. Before, before she was killed. Tell us why this is important. This is important because this is the last sighting of Michelle. As you can see, she's wearing a black jacket with white stripes. Uh, we're interested in uh, identifying anybody that was in Summerfields at that time or who have, may have seen her leave or in, leave in company with any person. We've also got CCTV of a potential uh, witness. Tell us about yes, this man. Yes, this man was seen a bit later on uh, in the morning, on the same day as Michelle's murder. Uh, he was seen walking across a car park close to where the body of Michelle was found. Uh, we're keen to identify that person as we believe that he is a, a vital and important witness to us. So if you know who this person is, please contact us. OK, Stuart, thank you very much. Thank and uh, a special thank you to you again and for coming to speak to thank us tonight you. on Crime Watch. If you can help, you must pick up the phone. This man needs to be caught. A serial rapist dubbed the Night Stalker has been jailed for life for the murder of one of his victims more than a decade after the death. Aman Bias was extradited from India to face trial for the 2009 murder of Michelle Samaria, 35, in Wolverhamstone, East London. The 35-year-old was also found guilty of five counts of rape causing grievous body harm with intent. He was sentenced to a minimum jail term of 37 years at Croydon Crown Court. The court heard Vyas preyed on lone women at night, turning a small area near his home into a hunting ground for violent rapes against at least four women. Prosecutor Tom Little QC called him the E17 Night Stalker. You will have seen the headline news about the murder of Katerina Kaneva. She was the 12-year-old found strangled after her father disturbed an intruder in their flat. The killer climbed out of a window to escape with the father in hot pursuit. He attempted to hijack a car, then a lorry, 
and then eventually he managed to force the driver of a Fiat Uno to give up her car. Now, this all happened in West London three weeks ago. But the police have now found three new crucial witnesses, and Hamish Campbell has new information. Now, before you just tell us about the new information, there were an awful lot of witnesses to that chase, and you've got a pretty good description of the killer. There were a number of witnesses, about 20. The man that we're looking for is in his 45 to 50 years of age, certainly the old, older man. He's five foot six, no taller than that. He's stocky build, muscular, slightly overweight. He is either bald or a very receding hairline. But at the back and at the sides, he has black hair, which is going gray. In addition, he had a cut to his face, some scratches, so witnesses should remember the blood on his face on that time. Now, you mentioned the 20 witnesses to the chase with the father and, and the attempts to hijack. Tell us about the new witnesses and what happened there. The new witnesses, we know he hijacked a car in Trusty Road and he abandoned that car no more than a quarter of a mile away in the Shepherd's Bush Road, just south of the Shepherd's Bush Green. He tried to get onto a 283 bus, but there was no driver. He came off that bus, he walked quickly across Shepherd's Bush Road and he got onto a 220 bus about 10 to 5 in the evening. The bus driver remembers he had blood on his face. We know he drove all the way down to Hammersmith, went to the new bus station in Hammersmith Broadway and got off at bus stop D. And that's the last we've seen of him. So you need to find people on that bus. What time of day was it? 10 to 5, 5 o'clock it arrived at Hammersmith. And this is on a Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. the 22nd of, of May. So anybody who goes on the 2.20 around 5 o'clock-ish on appear. a Thursday evening, that bus goes, what, to Hammersmith and then Wandsworth? And down to Wandsworth, yes. So we're looking for any witnesses on that bus to come forward. What, what, was, what was this man wearing? Clothing description indicates he was wearing a suit jacket or a sports jacket which was greyish in colour, light. Certainly the video picture shows a light jacket and darker coloured trousers. He seemed to, in the security camera pictures, he seemed to be carrying some sort of bag as well. He was carrying a bag, he obviously went into the house with a bag and he held onto it throughout the time he was trying to escape from the building site and in the car. He returned to the car to pick it up. Blue bag or black bag, small in size, A4 size, had possibly some lettering on the side, white. OK, there is no known motive for this. It could just be this is a man who wanted to kill someone. Please don't hesitate to call us. 0500 600 600. That's our free call number live here to Mr Campbell and his colleagues. Or you can call the incident room in Kensington in London. That's on 0181 246 0732. 0181 246 0732. A paedophile and multiple rapist who fled from custody in Poland to enter England as an illegal immigrant was told yesterday that he would die in prison after being convicted of murdering a 12-year-old girl in London. Andreas Kanowski, 48, who had convictions for 17 rapes, 8 attempted rapes and 1 attempted murder in Poland, evaded British immigration authorities for 6 years after a Polish judge allowed his release for an operation. Despite being arrested twice by British immigration officers, he was released each time as simply got lost, the old Bailey had heard. Katrina Canova, a Macedonian schoolgirl whose family had been granted asylum, was strangled by Konoski with the cord of her school bag after he forced his way into her home seven months after fleeing Poland.